Hello. In today's video sequence, we're going to discuss Darcy's law. Now, Darcy's law is an averaged equation for flow and pause video, and indeed, I would say, is the single most important equation if we want to study flow and pause video. It's an average of the flow over many pauses. So it's not like the Navier-Stokes equation that I presented previously, which looks microscopically how the, the velocity, what the velocity of the fluid is. It's an average over many pauses. So it's an empirical equation. So let's uh, present it straight away so that uh, we can see it by looking at the slide here. So this is Darcy's law. Okay, so as I said, it's the average velocity. It is strictly speaking the volume average velocity, taking both the void space and the solid where there's no flow, um, taken over many pores. And it can be derived from the Navier-Stokes equation, but it's quite a clumsy derivation. And it does end up with some impenetrable integrals that are related to the pore structure. So rather than do that, I'm going to present it empirically, which is indeed um, how the way, how it was first presented, was first used for, for, for many, many years. So what do we have here? On the left-hand side is Q. This is this volume average velocity, but it's now no longer a real velocity in the sense that if I were to take a water molecule, no, 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 it is not the speed that that water molecule moves. And so it's called the Darcy velocity, but deliberately I have not given it a symbol that's V um, because it represents physically the volume of fluid that flows per unit area, per unit time. And the area is an area perpendicular to it. And that makes perfect engineering sense. We pump fluids into the subsurface, we extract fluids out. We want to know what's going in and out. I'm actually not necessarily that interested in microscopically a fluid flow velocity, which if you've seen some of the previous videos, is in fact highly variable, even within a small piece of rock. Okay, so this is the averages. What is flowing per unit area, per unit time? Okay, and it is just the volume. Don't worry about correcting for porosity or it's just adding up lots of little holes. No, just the volume. It's just what's flowing. That's the end. Now, what's it related to? It's proportional to this grad P minus rho G T. Again, for those people who saw the video on the Navier-Stokes equation, that's essentially the driving force in the fluid. So fluid flow is governed by two things. One is a pressure gradient. There is a flow from high to low pressure. And the other is gravity. So the rho G term is uh, the effect of gravity that tends to make a fluid move downwards. Okay. Uh, the flow is inversely proportional to viscosity. Again, that makes... Uh, sense if you have a more viscous fluid it will flow slower okay but then what you're left with is this k this let's say proportionality constant okay and this is the new thing that's introduced in Darcy's law and k is the permeability and it's not dependent on the fluid that's in the porous medium it is a function only of the structure of the porous medium now the last thing I'm going to keep this equation up during this sequence, but the last thing that sometimes gets people a little worried or baffled when they do calculations is this pesky minus sign. But you have to have that minus sign because flow goes from high to low pressure. So the pressure gradient for a positive flow is negative. That is the grad P term, if I put a number to it, is minus something. Okay? And then the two minus signs cancel out, you get a positive flow. So you have to have that minus sign and you just have to keep using it um, I can say without panic. Okay, so that's Darcy's law. I'm going to keep Darcy's law up there. And we've introduced now the permeability. But now you might say, okay, but what are the units of this permeability? What really is it? So let's do this. Uh, you can look at units if like strictly looking at sort of length and time and mass and this sort of thing. I'm going to do it as uh, I like it in, in strict SI units and then see, see what's out for K. So the units of Q, although, as I said, it's not a true velocity, but it does have the units of velocity, are meters per second. Okay? The units of viscosity are pascal seconds. The units of pressure gradient, or the units of pressure are pascal, so it's pascal per meter. Now, the, now you might say, well, what about rho g? I don't see any pascals there. Um, if you break down pascals into newton per square meter and then per newton, you actually will find um, that the units of rho g are equivalent to pascals per meter. But I leave that as an exercise for you. Um, so the units of K will be the units of Q, which are meters per second, 
times the units of mu, which Pascal seconds divided by the meter. So the Pascals nicely cancel out, makes it easier doing it this way. Um, so to the seconds, and so we're left with meter squared. So K is, has the units of an area. Now, in physics, if you have a quantity like permeability that represents something about something, um, then the fact that it has units of an area isn't just, oh, well, it's coincidence, so what, let's move on. It means something. That means that the fluid flow is controlled by an area, okay, a typical area. Now, what is that area? No, 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 it is not the size of the rock sample. It is not some area in my aquifer or my underground reservoir. This is flow in porous media. And one thing really to get into your mind is flow in porous media is controlled by the pores, right? Small, microscopic interstices between the grains in the rock or the soil through which the fluid flows. And so the area that controls flow is the area of the pore. And typically, in some of the examples we've shown previously, we've looked at pores that are about 10 microns across. That's 10 to the minus 5 meters. So a typical area, just a order of magnitude estimate, is 10 to the minus 5 squared. So that's 10 to the minus 10 squared. So what we'd expect is that K is controlled by a typical pore area. And its magnitude is about 10 to the minus 10 square meters. Actually, the typical magnitude of K is about two or three orders of magnitude less than that, more like 10 to the minus 12, maybe 10 to the minus 13 square meters in the example I've shown, and highly variable. Um, also going to describe in another video. Um, it's much lower than this because actually, you don't just have a nice tube here and you just have flow along it, you have a tortuous pathway. And in fact, the flow is going to be limited by the smallest area you have to want to say squeeze through. Okay? And the other thing is, as you know, there is porosity. Porosity is the fraction of the total rock volume that is void space. And that porosity for rocks deep underground may be only 20%. So it's only a relatively small fraction of the pore space in which there is any flow. So, okay. So this all looks uh, fine, but like with SI units, sometimes you do get these very large, or in this case, small powers units, 10 to the minus 12. Mm, not, not ideal, is it? Well, actually, um, most people do not measure permeability uh, in square meters. Um, in fact, not even um, people like me who you know, are big fans of SI units. Um, what we do is we generally measure permeability in darcies um, or millidarcies, which is a thousandth of darcy. Darcy, obviously it's named after uh, the law, so that makes sense, and the person who first proposed it. But where does it come from? Well, it actually comes from a paper uh, written in 1933 by Wyckoff et al. Um, Wyckoff were they were petroleum engineers, reservoir engineers, and for the first time they took small rock samples from the reservoirs and they measured the permeability obviously, to assess the potential for flood. So they measured the permeability on these samples and they obviously then needed, well, let's say, to get a unit for it. And obviously there's an American paper some time ago, so at this point a unit's fumble occurs. So they defined the dot C in this way. They said, if we had a small sample, let's say a centimetre on each side, and there was a pressure drop, and I need a pressure drop, that is the pressure gradient, <laughs> right, is, is always negative. But it means that there's high pressure at the inlet, lower pressure at the outlet, but that pressure difference is one atmosphere, um, then the permeability of the rock would be one Darcy if the water flow rate was a centimetre a second. Again, that's a volume per unit area per unit time. Okay. Um, now, one bar is around 100,000 pascals, about 101 pascals, and viscosity of water at ambient conditions is around 10 to the minus 3 pascal seconds. So if you go through the calculation, again, I'm not going to do it here, but you can do it yourself, you find that a Darcy is around 10 to the minus 12 square metres but actually not exactly. It's more like 9.8 times 10 to the minus 13. So it's roughly a micron squared, but not quite. Now, um, I'm now going to make a proposal. Um, certainly, uh, as I recalled this, the previous week, uh, people redefined the kilogram. Um, I don't see why the porous media community can't sort of say leap into, well, I wouldn't even say the 20th century here, uh, maybe the the, the 21st century, maybe the latter half of the 20th century, and actually define the Darcy um, conveniently as 10 to the minus 12 square meters. And actually for engineering purposes, 
will be fine. It's basically a multiple squared. But the community hasn't quite got there because most people are still flapping around with stupid units, and so this seems fine to them. Um, it isn't. So um, we will, for working purposes, normally RC, etc., ten to the one twelve square meters. That isn't universally accepted uh, yet, but um, we, we we shall see. The other thing that's useful. Just as a simple example, our first example is flow under gravity. And this is certainly very important in hydrology. So imagine um, that there's no pressure gradient, right? So we're not pumping the fluids, we're not forcing the fluids to move. And the fl fluids we have basically in free fall. So they're just flowing through a porous medium under gravity. So if they're in free fall, there is no pressure gradient. So, and we look vertically. And so our equation um, simplifies as k rho g over mu. There's no gravity term. And that bunch of terms, the permeability times the density of water, times g divided by the viscosity of water, is called the hydraulic conductivity in hydrology. And sometimes rather confusingly called a permeability isn't a permeability, it's a, it's, it's a conductivity really. Um, and it has the units of a speed. And the question is then what that shows is how fast can the water flow? Okay. Now, this is an experiment you could do at home. Okay. You have a pot plant, for instance. And you take your pot plant and you water it. Okay. You have flow under gravity. The question is imagine you were to pour out some water very fast and say you had a centimeter of water sitting there in the soil. How long would it take for that water to soak through? If you had some water here, how long does it take before you see the water come out of the bottom of your pot plant? Now, normally you might say, mm, it takes a few seconds, doesn't it? Right. Say 10 seconds for a centimetre of water. So we're looking at about a millimetre a second. Okay, so KH is a millimetre a second, that's 10 to the minus three. The permeability then, right, multiplied by mu is 10 to the minus six, divided by rho, that's 10 to the minus nine divided by g that's about 10 it's about 10 to the minus 10 and um, it's about 100 doses so if you have a pot plant actually you've got a nice soil a nice granular normally a sandy soil with some organic material it will have a permeability that's typically tens or about 100 doses so it's actually very permeable right nice even open structure for your plot plant to grow in. now let's take another example there's a picture there of a puddle right and that's a puddle on sort of stony ground Okay, and you know, if it rains, you sometimes see puddles. Now, why do you see these puddles? In fact, okay, if it's on asphalt or, so, or an artificial surface, but if actually it's on the ground, um, the puddle is there because actually the water is able to flow through the porous medium, but really, really slowly. Right? That puddle may remain there for days. And in fact, the only way the puddle disappears is because the water evaporates. And so here you might have a puddle that's a centimeter deep, and it may take a day. For the water to move through. So now let's look at the uh, permeability of hydraulic conductivity there. A day is about 100,000 seconds, and so we're looking at something that's uh, 10 to the 5 and the centimeters 10 to the minus 2, so something like 10 to the minus 7 meters per second. Okay? So we're looking at something that's, that's much, much slower. Right? 10 to the minus 7 is four to the magnitude less in permeability, so we're not looking at 100. Darcy's, right? We're looking at a hundredth of a darcy or 10 millidarcy's, right? And that would be because you've got some fine soil or some clays. Actually, clays would be, be even less permeable. So I'll talk about that a bit later, but it's a very useful concept. Hydraulic conductivity basically tells you how fast you will flow under gravity, and it can be related very simply um, to the permeability. I'm going to finish here with um, what I would say a historical interlude. Um, certainly, hydrologists consider this quite important to introduce uh, the person who developed this law, who's uh, Henry Darcy, who was a French civil engineer, and he spent most of his career um, providing water resources to his uh, hometown of Dijon. Um, and in fact, most of this had very little to do with flow ports. We did collected water from springs that were then brought into the town centre and some of them were stored in reservoirs. Okay, here's the entrance to, to, to one of the, the reservoirs shown here. Um, near the end of his life, he wrote a book 
Okay, it was originally in French, but it has been uh, translated recently into English. So I'll say it in English, the public fountains of the city of uh, Dijon. Um, most of it, most of this book is full of beautiful engineering data, essentially of how he collected the water um, and the various means in which he, he brought the spring water to the center of the city. It's only late in his life, actually after retirement, that he did the experiments um, on which his famous law put into an appendix of his book is based. Now, what he was doing, why, why were you doing this, is if you have water, how do you know it's not polluted? How do you clean your water? You might say, oh, you put in some chemicals. Actually, that's not what you normally do. If you drink tap water, it's not full of chemicals, is it? In fact, the easiest way of cleaning water is to run it through a porous medium. And the reason for this is a porous medium has a huge surface area. So bacteria and viruses actually can absorb to the surface. And in fact, bacteria or clumps of bacteria can actually be physically sieved out by the porous medium. So it's quite usual here to have a sand filter to filter the water before it was provided for drinking. Okay, exactly the same as you can see if you go walking in the countryside, okay, you have a field with cows and sheep and whatever, don't know what cows and sheep do uh, in the water, you wouldn't drink anything in a puddle, and next door is a stream, and that water is completely clean. Okay, now, how, how does that happen? Again, because the water has flowed through a porous medium before it got into the stream. Okay, so that's what he did, he looked at flowing sand filters, he didn't present dulces on exactly the way I've presented, and often people go through a sort of historical rather boring idea of this is what Dulcie said, this is what other people said. Okay, let's, let's just deal with the modern form. Um, so let's now recognize that some of the key people in, in uh, fluid dynamics. So the character on the rather severe looking character on the left is George Stokes, right from Navier Stokes fame. Um, he actually spent more than 40 years as Lucasian professor of mathematics at uh, Cambridge University. Um, this is the post uh, that's also been uh, held by Isaac Newton. Um, and uh, more recently by Stephen Hawking, and uh, the present uh, holder is uh, Mike Cates. Um, then there's Jean-Claude Navier, um, who's got the stone statue, and Henry Darcy. The interesting thing is that both Navier and Darcy come from Dijon, and in fact, Darcy was almost aware, almost certainly aware of, I want to say, um, the form of the Navier-Stokes equation then, so he knew where these, these equations um, were coming from. So anyway, um, a recognition of uh, this key individual. Um, one interesting fact here is that he did um, style himself Henry Darcy, not Henri. I'm not uh, want to say putting some uh, English pre prejudice uh, in there. Anyway, so he's published this book. Um, it is a very important equation, Darcy's Law, and we're going to be uh, using it. In fact, we use it all the time for making calculations for uh, fluid flow of course, media. So. Thank you very much, and I will end this sequence here.